Okay. Our next resource person is Ms. Arze Glipo, who is the Executive Director of the Integrated Rural Development Foundation and the lead convener of the National Movement for Food Security. Arze, a board member of Portugal's provincial government, has been espousing stronger farmer role in community governance, particularly in the promotion of sustainable communities. IRDF has extensive work exposure among farmers in Central and Southern Duzon, Eastern Visayas, and Southern Mindanao. So friends, let's welcome Ms. Arze Lipo. Uh, okay, hello. Um, yeah. How is everybody? So I, I saw the list of participants and Many I know from way back. We've been doing a lot of uh, work in community building, in promoting inclusive, uh, sustainable development. So I think many of you knew already about um, the topics we are discussing, and uh, of course, knew the lessons. <laughs> we have been we have learned a lot of lessons from our community experience. Okay, so the topic is about building resiliency at community level, the IRDF experience. So IRDF has, has been in this work for almost 30 years already. We started um, in 1989 as a support organization to a major farmer federation. And then um, progressed into a more, you know, an NGO supporting independent uh, farmer organizations, both at the ground and at the national level. And even at the international level, we have also supported advocacies for food sovereignty at the regional and global level, being the secretariat of the Asia Pacific Network for Food Sovereignty. Okay, so um, just a, you know, a brief, uh, discussion about IRDF. So it in its vision is about, of course, as we all have this vision, but socially just, equitable, sovereign, progressive, sustainable, and gender fair Philippine society, where Filipinos are enjoying their basic and fundamental human rights. And with that vision, we have this uh, role, no? Yeah. Uh, the mission, IRDF is to contribute to the economic, social, and cultural empowerment of the rural poor by enhancing their access to and control of their land, water, seeds, capital, and natural resources. Of course, in the process, uplifting their social and economic condition. Um, our core program as, um, here, of course, is to build and strengthen the capacity of the rural poor to own and have control over their resources, mainly land productive resources. So if you're looking at that picture, a coconut land, for example, coconut <clears throat> farm, there would be a number of actors there. We have the smallholder farmer who probably owns the land via the government's land reform program. But this guy who is um, Climbing the tree is a farm worker. He is landless, probably belongs to one of the tribes there in the minority uh, indigenous peoples group there in Mindanao. So they have different, you know, different characteristics. And uh, uh, of course, building the strength and power of these marginalized groups would be um, entail different approaches to. So what we're saying is, of course, uh, this um, empowerment of these groups would entail several strategies, which include one of the central strategies of IRDF is to organize communities, build capacities of marginalized groups, farmers, fisher folks, uh, indigenous peoples, um, women and youth, but of course, we also have to complement it with um, policy advocacy, um, analysis, of course, 
and um, more recently, like in starting in 2013, we started to promote uh, social enterprise development, looking at the need also for these communities to be engaged increasingly in profitable social businesses. But at the level of the community or the production sphere, <clears throat> we also promote um, agroecological and sustainable farming methods. So amongst this is the promotion of organic farming, community seed banking, um, of course, uh, natural resource management, so the goal of the, this is to not only to ensure local food security, but also to ensure just and sustain economic viability of a small scale farm. And, and, a large, and, and a larger goal, of course, is to enhance and rehabilitate the environment and the resource base upon which farming depends. So it's, it's what we do in a nutshell. And the topic of community resiliency uh, is an important element of our work in the community. Now, uh, looking at this conceptual framework, <clears throat> uh, these are, you know, when we look at, when we discuss community resiliency, we have to look at four elements. First, resilience of what? So here is a community. <clears throat> might be a system or a process, but now we're talking about community. And uh, what resilience to what? So resilience to what? disturbances, uh, may it be, you know, impacts of climate change, flood, uh, storm surges. We have also the recurrent disasters. Then we have this pandemic. We also have the food crisis, for example, in when was this? 2008, it's also a, we have price shocks at the time, right? So this impact on the community and the ability of the community to adapt to these shocks or stresses are defined, it's defined by, let's say, the, the gravity of the exposure, the scale, um, also the vulnerability or the sensitivity different groups so there are you know how they are affected would depend upon many factors social economic cultural and the ability to decide then we have of course the adaptive capacity the the, the ability to to rise up no? to regain no? what has been lost so the, also there are many factors uh, influencing those adaptive capacity and these three, uh, of course, interact also with each other. And that defines your reaction, their reaction to the disturbance. So are they able to bounce back better? So I remember, in Rene, we have this book <coughs> about Yolanda, no? the impact of Yolanda on artisanal fishers and farmers in Leyte and Samar. And we were calling for bounce back better. But I don't know if they really bounce back better. Then probably the same situation, but they just you know, regain their livelihood. And maybe it's worse than before, you know? or they might, the system might have even collapsed. So that's how we look at you know, community resilience. Now, what was the experience of IRDF in working with communities that have been affected, that have been um, ravaged by, by these uh, disturbances. So in, we have in Sorsogon where we also work in um, several municipalities in the entire province of Sorsogon. We, we work with farmers, with women. Next slide, please. Um, with uh, artisanal fishers. So more recently, we have this problem of um, the imposition of a new law, the Rice Trade Liber Rice Tarification Act, which is actually also a shock no, to the farmers because prices dipped down last year to, you know, less than the cost of production. And uh, many farmers lost their incomes. And um, 
But worse than that, uh, the farmers in Sorsogon, um, particularly in this municipality of Irusin, um, their irrigation water, um, their irrigation system was destroyed by the very strong typhoon that um, occurred in December of last year. So like 500 hectares actually lost their source of uh, irrigation. But then, you know, like farmers, because of the losses they incurred from the deluge of rice imports last year, many still risk it and venture to plant, despite that, you know, they, there's diminished uh, supply of water in their irrigation canals. And as, as expectedly, by March, when the lockdown was declared and nobody can move around, they were desperate because their palai has have turned, you know, yellow, yellowish, the leaves have turned yellow. And, you know, they could not, they were, of course, you know, all their savings are there, no? And even their debt, they're indebted, no? Actually. Um, so, I think um, what, what they did, because these are also organized into irrigators associations and farmer organizations, they engaged dialogues with the provincial government. So, but of course, the damage was <coughs> larger than what the provincial government can do. It is uh, NIA's responsibility, the National Irrigation Administration, and of course, it can be repaired in two years' time, not, uh, you know, not that time. But uh, the provincial government offered to help uh, to uh, put up shallow tube well pumps as emergency measures. But then it has also to undergo some procurement. So what the farmers did, and of course, being one of the officials here, I also was able to ask immediately from the Department of Agriculture for emergency pumps. And it was installed as uh, shown in the next picture. Um, can we, yeah. So it was immediately installed, but this guy who is one of the farmers there uh, also offered one of his pumps because one pump is not enough to bring the water because it's kind of one kilometer away from the from the major from the river the source of irrigation so and then even one has also to lend so there are actually three irrigation pumps installed there another farmer so there's the solidarity here you know and uh, of course the da pump the two farmer pump and this guy he actually uh, watch over these pumps because it has to be operated because if it stops it has to you know it has to be again revved up the engine and so he has to sleep there in near the river no in order for for them for this farmer to save you know uh let's say 20 or 30 hectares not he has only one hectare farm. So the, the problem is that the fuel cost is so high and who has you know, the, the money, the money to provide um, the fuel for, for this. So I think uh, what the guy did is and then he met all the the farmers um, in, in his neighborhood, no? And they plan to, you know, to schedule watching over the pump and then also to contribute, contribute to the uh, fuel, to the fuel cost. Uh, excuse me, there is a call. So sorry. Um, so, wait. Hello. Um, so, besides uh, the Bayanihan or the cooperation of the farmers, um, and then sharing of cost and also another cooperative, um, the cooperative uh, offered to finance the, the, the maintenance of the fuel. The, um, 
Irrigators Association and the Farmers Organization also continued with the dialogue, uh, continued their dialogue with the National Irrigation Administration and also to um, hasten the construction of the dam. Because, you know, like there, out of, let's say, 1,000 farmers affected, uh, only, you know, emergency pumps can only do so much. Can only, like, probably benefit 50 farmers. So, how about the rest? So, they're also, um, they continued with the dialogue and um, networking with NIA and other government agencies. Okay, so that's the case. Then there's also a case, another case, but women, how they, um, yeah, how they address the problem of, uh, you know, the, the, when they were affected by also the same typhoon in December. So these are women, these are members of a women association called Kapai in another barangay, in another town. This one was uh, heavily damaged because of the strong, you know, wind uh, that fell down coconut trees, which is one of the main major crops in the community, also uprooted their crops, vegetables, wood crops, and destroyed their houses. It was a good, um, you know, it was good that before that, one year before that, Hello. Hello, po. Ah, hello. Yes. Ah, okay. So, yeah, the the so the women before that were already doing some kind of. This is a unique uh, uh, mode of savings mobilization because they they don't deposit it in in the bank uh, since the community is right far from the town center so they just deposit it in a safety box so daily they put in 20 now for safekeeping uh, the box is um, has three lock uh, has a lock and but has three keys uh, distributed to three dif different officers and so there's no one who can you know can open it uh, so it should be three officers and then with that savings they're able to because it was only a year after that they opened the box and it was after the typhoon. So they're able, some women were able to borrow like 5,000 and then they started up this as production capital to you know, uh, plant again or engage in, you know, like retailing, sari sari store, we call it here. So in a way, it was able to help them, um, um, you know, meet some needs like education, health and food needs of women, okay? And um, that's one way of building, again, resiliency in the community. Another, um, now it's in Sorsogon, we have, as I said, in 2013, we started um, promoting social enterprise. So we have been assisting the formation of cooperatives. One cooperative is the Sorsogon Pili, Next, please. Sorsogon Pili Producers Cooperative. Ah, this is a picture of the women yeah, saving. Can we go back to the picture? So that's, yeah, so that's how they do it. You take a look at the box. So it's only a box, no? They put in their money there, but there's also a recording, I think. So it's a good way also to develop a community spirit. So that's, I think, one good thing that even with a disaster, they are, they have this community spirit, this Bayanian solidarity values, okay? So another case is, as I was saying, we have supported the formation of a cooperative called the Sorsogon Pili Producers Cooperative, which is composed of, um, farmers, Pili, Pili farmers. Pili is one of the, another second, secondary crop, secondary crop in, and, and, and uh, also unique to, to Sorsogon. So it's a nut. Um, Sorsogon is the, like, 
major producer of nut of that nut uh, 55 percent of the that nut comes from sorsogon but sorsogon only supplies nuts to processors outside sorsogon like the gaspi city naga city so that the the value actually in the nut is more in the processing huh? more into the um, processed products like pili nuts or pili oil so that's I, the, the idea of why we supported the formation of a source of pili producers cooperative so that the pili farmers themselves would be able to um, get more value from from their product and not sell it as raw material um, it started with a few members but then expanded to now like 700 to 800 uh, members and they are active in um well not only in trading in uh, buying uh, from the farmers and then selling selling it to the small entrepreneurs or processors in the province but they're also active in policy advocacy so they're one of the um you know uh active uh, partners of the provincial government in formulating what the provincial government um, says the Pili Roadmap, which aims to bring Sorsogon into a status of the Pili capital of the Philippines, uh, meaning uh, promoting more value chain development in the Pili industry, um, creating more innovative products, producing more innovative products from Pili, not only from the candy, but now there's an emerging product called the Pili Elimi, which is an essential oil being used by pharmaceutical and um, you know, perfume companies in Europe. So now SVPC uh, actually is now a recipient of, um, you know, yeah, big projects from the provincial government and the Department of Agriculture, like warehouse processing for Pili oil and, um, and yes. So I think um, in terms of uh, developing opportunities for Pili, uh, CCPC is at the helm of this. Okay, and um, another example would be the our project program in building uh, livelihood resilience of smallholder coconut farmers in Mindanao. As we all know, coconut farmers is one of the poorest uh, sectors in the farming sector. Uh, many of them cultivate only around one to two hectares or less than one hectare of farmland. Mostly they, they are agrarian farmers also those who inherited it it from their fathers, from their ancestors, mostly smallholders um, with very low productivity, like you know, 60 nuts per tree per year and just earning less than 3,000 hectare per month, more, lesser than the minimum wage actually. So um, we started with a project there uh, in 2018 and one of these is in Barangay Kawayanon, which is a small barangay in the town of Makilala in North Cotabato. One of the leaders there is, uh, we call her Emerenciana Raneses, 72 years old, a senior citizen, but very active. She uh, attended a uh, lot of trainings from IRDF, um, training on farm diversification, on intercropping, on, on farm development. And then she also did a farm plan uh, to integrate uh, those, uh, you know, farming practices like soil and uh, soil and water conservation, um, use of uh, nitrogen, you know, leguminous trees, uh, mulching in order to restore the, so the fertility of the soil and you know, conserve water. And uh, I think because of these practices, or not I think, but uh, the, the, the reports that came from the field is that um, Aling Emerenciana increased uh, the number of uh, nuts that 
she harvest from her chick. Can we move on, please? Next slide, please. Um, so that Aling Imberenciana is the lady in the middle. So they work together. The women there, they're very active. So if you look at the tree, uh, the other side, the right side, there's the mulching, then there's the leguminous species. Then she's also intercropping um, the trees, the coconut trees with cacao, so, but they're just small, they're just growing, but they have bananas. So next please. Uh, from the, um, of course, they also have goats. Uh, they feed it with the uh, leguminous trees that they actually they plant. So next, please. Um, oh, in October, in October 2019, uh, North Cotabato was struck by a very by a set magnitude seven earthquake. So among those uh, communities that were devastated was Kawayanon and. Aling Imerenciana's house was totally destroyed, as you can see from this picture. Um, but it was, the, I think, the, um, the resiliency, the, the ability to, the ability to adapt, to, to recover from this uh, disaster, um, was brought about by the, the livelihood risk livelihood, um, the improvement in the farms, and then the livelihood that, um, you know, the additional earnings that she get from the farm because of the adoption of, um, you know, the new technologies that were introduced. Can we go into the next slide, please? So you see before the project, um, Ms. Renes is only, like harvest around 900 to 1,000 kilos of whole nut. But um, very more recently, just after this uh, earthquake, she's able now to, you know, produce like 1,800 kilos, earning her an income of 9,000 pesos. And more recently during this pandemic, even with the pandemic, she continues to harvest more than what she has earned before, no? Before the project. So she's now earning like 10,000. As I said before, they were earning like 3,000 only. So um, uh, community resiliency also requires um, that uh, the people, especially the farmers or you know the members of the community, they're able also to have um, to, to have more stable income or to, to earn more income from, from the farm, probably because it's more now diverse. Um, and then with more income, they can actually, um, you know, repair, no? And, and address the needs um, arising from, from you know, the, the destruction that they experience, okay? So that's it. Um, let's learn in building community resiliency um, next please so what are the key lessons that we can see from this first is that the community must be aware no, of the problems the vulnerabilities and risk that they face and must take action to address or minimize this. So that's why it's important that uh, in our community intervention, we need to integrate in the beginning, um, you know, the co community resource assessment and planning for disaster risk reduction management. So it's always integral in a community development approach because you don't know when uh, disaster will strike or when there will be disruption. So people should be aware of the different vulnerabilities that they face. And there's, I think, a lot of tools for that, for assessing that and empowering the community. When you say empower, they take action after a, after a disastrous event, after a disruption. They um, take action because they have the plan. Okay. 
Then second would be the presence of active and functional organizations or self-help groups. Strengthen the adaptive capacity of communities to disaster or, or disturbances. As you can see, um, most of those who responded um, immediately to the situation are organized uh, groups. So we, like we saw the women organization that have been saving already for one year, they are able to increase the financial capacity of their women members. So another lesson is that responsive public institutions that can readily transfer resources or provide emergency support to those affected are essential to help communities bounce back. So not only responsive, but you know, like they're also transparent because as we see in the Yolanda case, uh, the support bugged down because of what? Corruption, because of a lack of transparency. So I think essential is that also state, state ag agencies and institutions should be more responsive, okay? Then also the local government must be responsive. And then often the support by one agency is not, um, it's not sufficient. Even all, the support of NGOs or you know, the private sector, there, it may not be enough to address the scale of the crisis or the multiple crises. So you need to have interagency support or you have to have a multi-sectoral approach. You have health, you have economic, you have agriculture. And then you have to involve, um, of course, uh, not only government, private, but the community themselves. And in this case, networking is crucial. So like the farmer irrigators, they have to network with the cooperatives for the cooperative to finance them. They have to network with the public officials, with agencies, you know, to push them to work hard even in the context of pandemic. So, so yeah, it's needed and it's not only in the formal network, but also informal networks. So as you can see, uh, Marinciana was able to rise up, to bounce back, to rebuild her house. Actually, it's not shown that she has already a wooden house, but because of the support of relatives, or of her children, so it's more of a formal network. Then the next, uh, next please. It's only a few. Affected members of the community have different needs. So that's why it's very important in the beginning of community intervention, we really need to have a thorough assessment because there are different groups. Uh, groups are stratified also. So you have women, you have men, you have farmers, you have indigenous people, you have farm workers. But targeting the most vulnerable would be the first step because they are the ones not able to bounce back immediately. But then I think in the process, you have to have a more inclusive approach because that is where you build trust. So you don't have, you know, like in this pandemic, there is this support from, for, you know what we call that support, 5,000 sub. So this group was um, prioritized, but then there's another group, the, the wage earners who were not, you know, allowed to go out, but then also need support but they're not the first one to be given. So you have to be inclusive because the scale of the crisis is so huge, it impacts everyone. And more importantly, I think people must be treated not as passive recipients, but as prime actors in the recovery with defined responsibilities. And I think this is where the, the approach to the pandemic, I think, uh, failed because it offers a top-down approach, a militaristic solution, and you know, community members are just waiting, right? What, what to do? So it was fear that actually engulfed them. Right? It's not action. So I think uh, in pandemic has to be, addressing the pandemic is also a public health concern. And it has, you have to mobilize also the people in making them safe, you know, there are so many, so many approaches to that, not only a lockdown measure. Okay, so, but in the case also of like the farmer irrigators, they have to act because that is their source of livelihood. 
So if they don't act, of course, they will, their harvest will fail, they will incur huge losses. So uh, people have to act in the first place. Um, you, you don't have to treat them as you know, benefactors. Then, of course, it's important that there should be innovation and technology. It plays an important role in the recovery process in building community resilience. You don't have to go by the same, you know, a, you know business as usual. This, this, especially in the, in, the, in the context of climate change, you, you have to be more innovative. You have to, to design more adaptive systems, diverse systems. But then here, science and traditional knowledge should go hand in hand, should complement each other. And in looking at changing or transforming agricultural systems that have been dominated by, you know, like, you know, the use of chemicals, you know, a monoculture, etc. You have to have a group approach. We have been saying that, Dean Rene and I, we have been saying that it's, you don't have to go one by one to farmer. You have to mobilize farmers and farmers themselves can disseminate the technology. So it has to be a group, group approach in order to address you know, changing large-scale systems. And I think um, eventually you cannot, you know, if you want to bounce back better, might be you need to, to check on the policies that are probably constraining the, um, you know, the recovery. In the case of farmers, for example, even if they have sufficient irrigation water, if imports would coming in because of the, of the Rice Tarification Act, the farmers will still be losing. So you have to change also the policies. You have to change the institutions. Maybe it's not the machineries that are needed. It's not the, you know. So it's a whole, um, also a transformation of the system. Also giving more voice to farmers because farmers for the longest time, they're not into policy making. So if we want to really to sustain the, what, the resilience, we have, to change, we, and that's where I think the social solidarity economy comes in to play. You know? So, and last, and this I quote from the resilience that or, or courage, and I agree with that. We need courage to confront challenging issues and take responsibility for our collective future. So I don't have to, I do not need to say more. We really need courage, especially in this pandemic. And uh, lastly, linking community, last slide please. Uh, linking build, building community resilience and social solidarity economy, as I said, in the context of climate change and it is recurring and it is new normal. And then we have this, you know, this pandemic. We have in the future, maybe food crisis with even the, the rice exporting countries may be experiencing supply constriction production constriction because of, you know, um, changes in, in geopolitical um, events happening in Southeast Asia, and even price shocks. The capacity to adapt or be resilient will spell the difference if a community is able to retain its basic values and structure and survive the onslaught of people's livelihoods, health, and well-being. And thus, I, I think community resilience is a crucial element in building a social solidarity economy but because it addresses the sustainability of this system. But also, that social solidarity economy being transformative, being, I know, a, an alternative to this neoliberal economic development model that has been driven by profit, that has uh, exploited and impoverished people, <clears throat> I think is, it is also a necessary condition for communities to be resilient. So I think that is how I sum it up, the link between community resilience and social solidarity. So thank you very much. So thank you very much, provincial, board member RZ Lipo. I, while listening to you, I was thinking, Sana, all our elected officials had the same sharp development perspective as you. 
and our country would be in such a better position. Okay, so thank you for sharing thank those inspiring. Um, ha, sana po katulad ninyo lahat. <laughs> oh, we will, we will, we should strive for that. I, I, that's also my wish, and even up to the national. I think it's yes, all the way, all elected local officials. So thank you for those um, inspiring experiences from IRDF in Sorsogon, Irosin, Sorsogon, and in also in North Cotabato.